This is The Bagel Report, a podcast exploring Jewish representation and identity in popular culture with your hosts, Esther Kostanowitz and Aaron Ben Moshe, and now a production of Jay, the Jewish News of Northern California. Hello. Hello in there. Aaron, it is the morning after. You know, we're going to get to the Oscars in a bit because we we have a lot to say about it. And uh, you and I both, I think, the Oscars is kind of like our Super Bowl. And it's not that we don't have love and space uh, to talk about other awards shows, because obviously we do that too. Each one of them is our baby when it's happening. And then we scorn and deride them when they're in the rear view mirror. I guess that's what the work of a critic is, I guess. Yeah. Right? Oscar just has like a special place in our hearts. Yeah, we're really excited to talk about it. I do want to say that the night before the Oscars, I wished someone an air of Oscar. And then you, what did you tell me the morning of the Oscars? <laughs> that I uh, I saw Jody berman Kostanovich, who is the Oscar queen for all of the reasons. Um, she wrote on her, something about the Oscars on her on her wall on Facebook, I guess in her timeline, we say now. We used to say wall well, back in the day. <laughs> But she wrote something about the Oscars, and then I wished her a Chag Sameach, because it truly is a holiday for her. It is something she does more preparation for than I would say most or any Jews do for the high holidays. Totally. It is both her Super Bowl and her Yamim Noraim, her Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur time, where all that she's looked at and reflected on is judged I love it. And we feel that way too. So it's nice to be in good company, but we're not going to talk about that yet. In a minute, we're going to talk about it, but there's some new and Jewy things that we have to get to first. Last Wednesday night, Thursday, depending on where you were in the world, we lost an icon. We lost Topol, um, Chaim Topol, but everybody knew him as Topol. He was everybody's Tevia on Fiddler on the Roof. And I say that because, yes, there was more than one, but he was the one who played it more than 3,000 times. Like, he played it on stage and he played it on film. And both entities are important and and were important to so many people. And it was so sad because um, Israel's president confirmed the death. He died in Tel Aviv and he was... Um, he was battling Alzheimer's disease. And that is just, I think, one of the most heartbreaking things in general when you hear someone has that disease. But most importantly, someone like, not most importantly, but when someone like Topol, who has literally had such an incredible, important career, and like now I don't know how much of it he like remembered in the end. Like that just breaks my heart. He was 87. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you're right, obviously, about about Alzheimer's and dementia and all of those things that really affect the memory. Because, you know, one of the things that we enjoy most in life is saying, remember when, or that reminds me of the time I, mm-hmm. or did you ever meet this person and all of those things and experiences, and especially you're just, like you're saying, you know, when you do that 3,000 performances as Tevya, like it's part of you. And to, to think that maybe he didn't know that toward the end is, is is super sad. One of the best things about film and theater and people whose images have been captured in performing and providing art is that their legacy lives on after they are no longer here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the the average person, I think now that we have everybody photographing every part of their day all the time, like we all in some ways have that digital footprint, that record of the things we've produced in the world. And so, yeah, it was, it was a real blow to lose, to lose Topol, whose first name is Chaim, by the way. I do want to share like a couple more uh, famous Tevias that we have known over the years. Mm -hmm. We had Zero Mostel, who also was in the producers. We had Theodore Bakel, who lived in Los Angeles for many years and was very famous um, and also was very involved in the Jewish community here. Um, I met him at a um, Lee Mood conference a while back. And also we had Alfred Molina, who was, you know, Doc Ock in Spider <laughs> something. One of the Spider-Men persons things. Actually, two of them now because he was in the most recent one as well. But he also played that guide, the local guide for Indiana Jones in the first Indiana Jones movie, the one who tried to double cross him. 
I don't know if you knew that. Mm-mm. That's one of my favorite little. Okay, so anyway, that's Alfred Molina. Also, we had Harvey Firestein, who, you know, does the Harvey Firestein thing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of other people who have played Tevya over the years. And it means something that Topol is known as kind of like the preeminent Tevya. So, you know, I think people loved him so much. And you saw it when he died last week and people all of a sudden started talking about Topol again. Yeah. And it was strange to me because also, I mean, okay, this is because of my very specific upbringing, but I, I work in news and I, I wrote obits for him at work and I, you know, picked clips to run under it and people did not know who he was right off the bat. And I, it really shocked me. I was like, how could you not know who this man was? Because even from an early age, like this Fiddler on the Roof movie, right? Even like if I couldn't ever see Fiddler on the stage, which I did eventually see. But like, if I never saw it, I would always have Topol on film. And that movie, I think we watched hundreds of times in my lifetime. And like, everybody knew him in my world. So it was very crazy to me to all of a sudden be in the space where nobody knew who this man was. And also, I think he's my favorite, Tevya, because he was able to be like warm and inviting. Like the Jewish men in my life, they were maybe tough but they were always very loving and everything they did came from a place of I'm doing this because one, it's tradition, but two, it's because I love you. And like, I, I want what's best for you. And I feel like some of them, some of the takes on Tavia are either like too silly or they're too tough. And there's there, you need like a middle because when Tavia goes through immense change and growth. And, you know, some argue he's like this Jewish feminist, right? The character, like when he goes through this journey, you need to believe that both exist within him. And in his performance, I always bought it. I always believed it. And it was just, it it makes you keep coming back to watch. And I'm sad that he's, he's gone. Yeah. I I think, you know, the idea of Topol as Tevya is something that is just so ingrained for so many of us. Like my entire Fiddler on the Roof knowledge is all that film, that film, that 1971 film. When I think of Tevya, I think of Topol. And when I think of Topol, I think of Tevya. Um, there is one little like weird Gen X thing that I have to put in here because I know some of our folks at home who are listening uh, like when I do this. So please excuse this old person corner. There was a commercial and I'm, I, I he almost hear some of our listeners like kind of saying, yes, I know what you're going to say. Go say it, Esther. But there was this commercial for a toothpaste in the 80s. And the toothpaste was called, was named Topol. T-O-P-O-L, just like this. And it was known as the smoker's tooth polish. And so every time somebody would say, oh, uh, I saw Topol. And then somebody would say, oh, you mean the smoker's tooth polish? You know, it was just one of those things that was a kind of a stimulus response thing that we had during the 80s. And that's why everybody is so weird today. Um, anyway. No, I'm glad that's why. I'm glad we sure, know Sure, 80s commercials are a whole thing. So anyway, we will miss Topol. Thank you for all you did. We hope that wherever you are, you have three staircases, <laughs> one going, just going up, one just going down, and another one just for show. I love that. And moving on in our new Ian Jewy, the second Shazam movie is premiering this week. That's either today when you're listening or it's March 17th, which is Friday. That's when the movie comes out. And while Zachary Levi, who plays the superhero version of Shazam, sounds Jewish, but isn't. I know. Shocker. I'm sorry if if you're learning this for the first time. Zachary Levi, not Jewish, who also played Benjamin in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, not Jewish. His kid alter ego in the movie, who plays Billy Batson, Asher Dove Angle, Angel, Angle, Angle, probably Angle, is, he is Jewish. Did you know that? I did not know that, but I think it is Angel. I know Asher Dove. I know that one. Or like Dove, depending on the dialect. But a few fun facts about this Jewish actor. He almost didn't have his bar mitzvah. Oh, he grew up in Arizona, just like another famous Jewish man, Spielberg. Uh, he grew up in Arizona and he almost didn't have a bar mitzvah because he was acting. Like it was like a, almost a conflict with something. And his mom was like, okay, this is ultimately your choice, but like, I'm going to give you some reasons as to why maybe you should like rethink it. Like he's saying this in some random interview. And then he ultimately like agrees that he should have it. And so he had it in his house. He has a bar mitzvah in his house. Isn't that funny? I thought that was kind of funny. 
That's amazing. I just thought it was very interesting because like we talk about all the time in Marvel and I guess lately in DC that like they strip away Jewishness or they're so worried that Batman could look too Jewish. So they, you know, they try and like bury that. But then you take two people who like have been told that they're Jewish or not and they happen to play Shazam and that's not a problem. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, I think somewhere somebody is doing an interpretation of the word Shazam, which does sound like a Hebrew acronym. Like maybe it's like Shema, Sionut, Zionism, and Mem would be, I don't know, um, movies. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I think, you know, we're, we're coming up on on Passover and in the Haggadah, there's a, an acronym of all the different plagues. Oh. Tzach, Hadash, Belchav, which is like the first letter of each of the 10 plagues. And it sounds like that, Shazam. I feel like maybe there's something in there. Rabbis who are listening, please go make an acronym from Shazam and tell us what it stands for. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't. I, I like the first movie as it was. I don't know if we need a sequel. I don't know if I'm going to run out to see it, but I'm excited that I love them together. I think they're chem- like the chemistry of playing both care like both sides of Billy is really funny to watch. Although Zachary Levi has been really weird on the internet lately, so that's bumming me out. But Asher hasn't yeah. done anything weird yet, so go Asher. I feel like. <laughs> Weird on the internet should be like its own, like if this were 2004, I'd be like, I'm going to start a blog called Weird on the Internet um, and then just talk about all the people who do things that were, things are just completely say. out of character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, really weird. But there's also some internet rumors unconfirmed by Marvel that in the Fantastic Four reboot, reboot, which is like, you know, the third yeah. time they're trying Fantastic Four. <laughs> third time's the charm. For four, for four. Like, so anyway, and the the rebooted reboot, it looks like they're trying to hire a Jewish actor to play Ben Grimm, the thing, who canonically is Jewish, but no one has confirmed anything. This is just, you know, internet rumor. But I think it's good to have an internet rumor like that because, you know, it shows that it's uh, something that's on people's minds. You know, the idea of you don't have to cast every Jewish character as Jewish, but when you cast no Jewish characters as Jewish, that's that's where the problem is. Uh, we've we've hit this point a number of times in previous episodes. I imagine that we will still will continue to hit that point. And it's a little random because the last thing on our list is okay, Apple TV Plus is killing it. They've got they're like the new Netflix HBO Max. Every week they're coming out with something new this spring. Their lineup's insane. But this new show that's out this week is called is it extrapolations or extrapolations? Hard to know which one it is. But well, if you have some <laughs> appellations and then you have some extra ones. So um, it's extra appellations. All right. Extrapolation. Well, it's this very strange. I had to watch the trailer twice because the first time I watched it, I didn't understand what it was about because I saw David Diggs as a rabbi and David Schwimmer was in the congregation, but it was also raining and they were wearing boots. So I was like, what is this about? And then I realized, oh, it's like a end of the world space climate change. Are we going to space? Are we going to take care of this planet? It's all about that. But I think it's so interesting that there's like a Jewishness, faith mixed with science and climate and like taking care of the world. Very like Takuno Lum theme all together in this show. And I'm so confused by it. But I'm like, huh, this is crazy. Okay, I think I think it's worthy to now mention on the Bagel Report. (laughs) No, totally. I mean, there, you know, a trailer isn't very long. And the fact that there are two like distinctly Jewish, Jewishy things that 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 you can see on screen, it's very important. Obviously, the end of the world narrative that comes along with a search for meaning mm-hmm. and spirituality. So I'm not surprised to see a spiritual leader in there. I'm a little surprised that it's a rabbi. I'm a little surprised that it's David Diggs playing a rabbi. He is Jewish and he has given a number of interviews in which he's talked about how playing a rabbi has really brought him back into uh, connection with his um, Jewish roots. I'm always happy when somebody gains empathy for an affinity with Jews when playing a Jewish person, mm-hmm. uh, even if that person is not Jewish. When that person is Jewish and has an opportunity to connect to something that they already had inside them, but they didn't really know how to develop it, and it, it infuses their work with extra meaning, great. Mazel tov. 
Yeah. He already has a puppy for Hanukkah, so we already know he's in it and to win this, it. This is why I'm excited because I, and we're going to talk about it later too, because it keeps coming up. Like we keep wanting Jewish representation, but we also don't want the same kind of Jewish representation. We want it to become more nuanced and share different perspectives of the Jewish faith, because the only way we can actually defend the argument of not all Jews are the same is if you show different types of Jewish observance and Jewish culture. And so it's very cool that you can see something very familiar, like a congregation or a talis or a kippah or a mezuzah or whatever. But then the the people who are embracing it don't look, you know, like the same, like stereotypical New York Jew or the the same Ashka forward Jewish type, because that's important. Still trying to make Ashka forward happen, Aaron. It's hey, it's the bagel reports fetch. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. You know what I mean? Totally. I will say also, just in terms of those two Jewy moments in the trailer, uh, the first one you talked about, which was a, a shul scene, and the scene takes place in front of an ark that's the uh, the Aaron Kodesh that has written over it, Dalif Neemiata Omed, which is one of those phrases that is often above an ark in the synagogue. And it means know before whom you stand. It's supposed to remind people of humility and of the experience of of prayer and communicating with uh, the divine and all of that good stuff. And that was a great moment as you spoke about, but I don't know if you caught it, but there's a rally Mm -hmm. also where there's a barricade and the barricade is in Hebrew and it says mishteret, which isn't really right. I think mishtara is what it should say, uh, which is police in Hebrew. This is at least the letters are going the correct way and they got all of them right except for one. But um, because the the final hay was made into a taf, I have a feeling that somebody copied it from something somebody wrote for them because mm-hmm. it's the hay and the taf look very similar. And if you if you don't know if you don't speak Hebrew, you might think that they're the same letter. But nonetheless, it's not like like it's not the scene is like a riot. The scene is like a protest almost. So I'm I'm very interested to know like because you're right, I didn't catch it on the first watch, I saw, okay, there's police, there's some hologram person telling people to stay calm. But then it's like, wait, where are we? What is it? Like, there's so much in this trailer. And I'm very excited about what this show's going to be. Yeah. I I mean, the at the riot or protest or whatever this is, there are signs in different languages, um, including Spanish. There's also a sign, like a neon sign for um, Yisra Kart, I think it is. It's like one of, there's a, it's hard to read, but it's a, like a, an Israeli company that has a neon sign. So I'm going to assume this is in Tel Aviv somewhere, mm. but I don't know why. And I guess that's one of the, the mysteries that will unravel as we watch extrapolations. Let's do it. Before we get to the the meat and potatoes of the Oscars, Erin, I want to know like what the Oscars watching was really like for you. I had a good time. We usually, we do like a really big party and have all of our friends watch. And this year it was much smaller. Like we went to a friend and then we came back to our apartment and we watched with my in-laws. And it was funny because on the way there, there was like a driving moment where we didn't have any access to the TV. So I called my mom and she was giving, she and my dad were giving me updates. The Oscars are a big deal in my family. And so it's like, we always grew up watching them. We always grew up I feel like I was one of the kids in the Midwest where like when the the actresses are talking or the actors are talking right into the TV and they're like, dream big, like you can do this. Like I always felt like, hey, maybe like that can be me one day. Maybe like I can grow up and like leave Michigan and pursue something I'm really passionate about here in LA. And like, it's very surreal too, because I have a lot of friends who are in the industry and like they're doing projects and I, I just like, I know it's like not one of those guesses. It's like, I know it's just a matter of when that like, I'm going to know someone who's like accepting an award at the Oscars one day. And so like, it's a very emotional experience watching it because you're like excited. How amazing is that, right? I mean, I think that that's part of the uh, the mystique of living here, you know, during this time of year, you know, just knowing that anybody you pass could actually be at, at the theater, mm-hmm. you know, trying, you know, as part of a team accepting an award it's also a good reminder that even though a lot of 
focus is obviously on the acting awards, the directing awards, and the best picture. But I think that seeing all of the different things that go into movie making, you know, the things you don't think about, most people don't think about when they go to the movies is like the cinematography Mm -hmm. and the sound editing and, you know, all of that good stuff. I, I do like when they do like little retrospectives about like how that's evolved over the years. And I think it's interesting for folks who like Hollywood um, and the business of show, as they say. But I think that there's also like a lot of opportunity for um, for people to see themselves in the future on screen. That must be so magical. I mean, I, I will never probably go to the Oscars. <laughs> I used to love hosting Oscars parties, but then I started getting annoyed by everyone commenting all the time. Mm-hmm. So now I just, I focus my energies on on the tweeting place because I can mute everybody and then watch what they said later. Yeah. And this year I was sick, so I didn't have to feel the pressure to go out somewhere and, you know, I could stay home, drink tea. It's nice. uh, Invent recipes involving ingredients I have already in the house. (laughs) You know, it's just like, it's like, yes, I am a party animal. You know, that's the way to do it. Keep it quiet. Keep it chill. I will say like this Oscars show was very surprising. I was, I was surprised at how like good it was because after last year there was a lot of chaos and it was nice to be able to concentrate because I want to show you something we can't like see it but I want them to hear it this is my Oscar ballot I I printed it from the Oscars and every year they're so chaotic because they don't know what the order is going to be but I wish they would like make you know it make it go like okay the the top the big seven go at the top and then it trickles down like it's just it's Wait, very show disorganized. It to me again? Okay, great. <laughs> and I got 17 right, which I'm wow. I'm not mad about. My record was 19 and I honestly like I'm okay. See, I don't put money on them because sometimes I'm okay. I'm very happy when things don't go my way. Sometimes there's like curveballs and I'm like, wow. I, and I, you know, cause I, I, I think like the Academy and I go, okay, what are they going to probably put? And then I have like an addendum sometimes of things I want to win. Um, like Marcel the Shell. I wanted Marcel the Shell to win, but I knew Pinocchio I was going to win. But people, like I sent pictures of my ballot to people and someone won money last night. So congratulations to them. Um, really stressful for me. I did not want people to lose money on my behalf. Tried to be as forthcoming as possible, but. Jody Berman Kostanovich, she's the co-host of Two Movie Jews, and she's like literally seen all of them. She got 18 out of 23. So I am like, okay, I did it. That is awesome. <laughs> I actually gave up doing ballots a long time ago, but I'm very proud of you. And being Jody, Jody adjacent on this particular Chag Sameach um, is definitely worth bragging about. It's like almost like finding the Afi Komen good. <laughs> oh, totally. I bet a lot of people can relate to that statement. But on the show itself, I thought Jimmy Kimmel, I, thought I, was a, I was a little nervous because last year there were three women who had to host. I loved all three of them. I don't really love that they one guy is allowed to host, but two or three women need to host. I don't really love that. Um, and I was nervous that Jimmy Kimmel was just going to kind of be the same old, same old because he's hosted so many times. But I thought his monologue was great. I thought he was like, he had really good jokes that were big laughs and also like were able to lighten the room because that is a tense room. It's not like the Golden Globes. Like everybody who reports on what that atmosphere feels like, it's tense. People are very nervous because they could win the biggest award of all time. So you need someone who's going to, you know, give them something to like ease the tension. And I think he did a good job with that. I think, you know, I didn't do a point for point comparison, but I think he also like has professional relationships with all of those people Mm -hmm. he's talking to. So it's not like, you know, he has a show that's been on a long time. He's had a lot of celebrities on. Um, He knows how to make them feel comfortable. They know what they're getting with him. So there's a lot of trust there. And so I think that that's super important. Yeah, I think he did a fine job. I laughed a couple of times during the monologue. But, you know, Jimmy Kimmel knows how to do and deliver a monologue. His writers were his writers. And 
you know, that's that's what happens. The rest of the show, the the scripted banter was horrifying. Yeah. There was this one really Jewish moment mm -hmm. which stood out to me. Uh, the intentional inclusion of Jews in the promo spot for the Academy Museum. Mm -hmm. Now, as we remember from when you and I visited and all of the ensuing conversations after that about Jewish erasure at the Academy Museum, the fact that they don't really mention much about Hollywood's early days or in which were all, you know, many studios were founded and the entertainment business was really shaped by Jewish immigrants to the to the United States. And it seems like the Academy has heard that because they made sure to mention a part of the diverse stories that they tell there. They include Jews on the as the beginning of that spectrum, you know, kind of like from the founding by Jewish uh immigrants or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was interesting that they went out of their way to do that in such a short promo. But I, I went to the website afterwards to see what new inclusion they had for Jews, and I didn't see anything. So it's possible that it's in the works. I think I had read something about how something was coming in April, but it would be great if they kind of promoted that on their website because we're still absent. It's so funny. You and I are not there. That's my that's my big complaint. <laughs> it, it just feels funny to me because they did that a lot at the Oscars last night. They gave big shout outs to women. They gave big shout outs to like the little, you know, the Jewish inclusion and blah, blah, blah. And then they did a lot for like the black filmmakers without actually honoring them at all. It's like, we're going to honor you, but we're not going to nominate you. Um, and we can't say the same for the Jews because yes, Spielberg, there were Jewish people who were nominated last night, but like, it's just very performative. And it's like, I don't need the performative shout out. I just need you to include it. And like recognize it as good enough and equally as good, if not better, in the work. Just do it. Just do it. Just make an attraction. Like not make an attraction, but like make something more Jewish in the museum than the names. Don't just like give shout outs to the woman king and then not nominate them. Like don't do that to Angela Bassett where you're plugging her and essentially saying she is going to win only for her to not win. Like there's just all those little moments all throughout the night or like where they make a joke about that there's no Jewish directors, like to acknowledge it. Like, I'm glad you're acknowledging it, but just do the work. Just do the thing. And then we don't have to make a weird joke about it where we're applauding you because, yeah, you're naming it, you know? Yeah. Look, this is a this is a conversation in progress that that we are happy to have with Hollywood anytime it wants to. Yeah, call us, Hollywood. Just give us the ring. <laughs> and be like, then we'll answer the phone. We'll be like, hello. And then we'll be like, hello, it's Hollywood here. Calling to see if you want to have a conversation. There's that reporter And then voice. we'll have to be like, I'll be like, Aaron, <laughs> Hollywood is on the phone. I'll run downstairs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, wait, we've been we've been saying all the things we like, but then actually like, you know, yuck it. So, OK, we are happy. We I, one of the surprises of the night, the very early surprises of the night was that Jamie Lee Curtis won her first ever one. She was nominated for the first time and then won her first Oscar for everything, everywhere, all at once, which I'm delightfully surprised because I definitely thought it was going to Angela Bassett. Right. I think that there was no way I was going to be happy with this category just because I felt like Angela Bassett really deserved an Oscar. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think Hollywood likes to do is reward people for having a long career. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, there's, they talk about that every year about how when some super experienced actor, well, very well regarded is in a small role and then they nominate it and you're like, why, why did that get a nomination? And then the answer is because Hollywood really likes itself and they really like this actor. And so they gave it a nomination and then possibly also an Oscar. Aside from any lingering racism that, um, that some people, uh, say that the Academy still traffics in, I think that Angela Bassett, her chances were damaged because her performance was in a Marvel movie. And mm -hmm. I think the Academy doesn't like that. Yeah. So I think that the question is, if Wakanda Forever was not a Marvel movie, do I think she would have won? And I think she might have. But there was a lot of, a lot of, you know, it's, it's kind of cliche to say that a lot of Hollywood is storytelling. Obviously it is. But I think that Hollywood likes a comeback story. They like an underdog story. 
And they like the idea of somebody who has been there the whole time, all of a sudden emerging into their own. And that's, that's Jamie Lee Curtis. It's, it's Kei Hui Kwan who won for best supporting actor. And, you know, the fact that everybody in that room remembers him as short round and as data and the Goonies. Mm -hmm. And as they pointed out, a co-star of Brendan Fraser's in Encino Man. You know, I think that everybody knows his face and his story. Um, and it's like, we have a lot of nostalgia for him. It's not that he didn't do a good job. He did an amazing job. But I think that that's all part of the story when these people are are elevated to that stage. But I will say, I mean, yes to all of that. I think there's a lot of truth in that. But I, I think like the actors in Everything Everywhere All at Once had to play multiple versions of their character. And Jamie Lee Curtis even said in one of these interviews, she did not actually understand all of the scenes in the movie until she was watching it. She just knew, okay, this is the character she's playing now. This is the character she's playing in this scene. They are literally playing drastically like contrasting types of characters in the same character. And I think it's incredibly impressive and it shows all that they can do, like Michelle Yeoh, Jamie Lee Curtis, and um, Ki Hoi Kwan. I think they're all incredibly talented. And also, Stephanie Hsu is also incredible. I think, yeah, she was too young. I think she was too young. They were not going to give it to her because she was too young, which is a bummer because I think she was also the most grounding moment of that movie. And I think you're right. I think they they like to pretend that they care about Marvel, that they say Marvel's breaking history at the Oscars, and then they don't care. But also, Woman King is very similar to the world of Wakanda. And that was not Marvel. And that was not shut. That was not nominated for anything. It's like they threw a bone to the things that got people back to theaters this year, but didn't take it with such seriousness because they didn't think the quality was good enough. And I think it's such a disservice to the performance Angela Bassett made because that was an incredible performance of a queen mourning the loss of her son. And whether it's a superhero movie or just a movie, I'm, I'm bummed for her. And I'm bummed that we have to choose to be happy for one and not the other. Like, I want both right. to exist in the same space because I do think Jamie Lee Curtis has been in the industry a long time. And people thought of her as this silly, comedic person who wasn't serious enough to, like, wasn't taken seriously enough to be in the big game. And she finally entered. And I think that's a big deal. And we should be happy for her. And also sad that it didn't go to Angela Bassett. But I don't want to hate on Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, it's difficult. It's hard. Right. Well, I think that that's part of the problem of this awards show construct in general is that it identifies one person as the best and the other people in the category as snubbed or losers mm -hmm. or whatever the story is. You know, they say they snubbed Angela Bassett um, for her work in Wakanda Forever. I've seen that headline a bunch of times yeah. today. And I'm not sure that it is a snub. She didn't win. Um, the other people in the category also didn't win. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there is... I mean, Kate Blanchett, four weeks ago, four weeks ago, on, like everyone thought she had it in the bag. For Tar, Tar wasn't going to win anything except it was going to win Best Actress. That was the conversation four weeks ago. And then all of a sudden, everyone started having, like, love for everything, everywhere, all at once, which I am excited for. But, like, it changes so quickly. But, yeah, C Kate Blanchett was not snubbed, even though she was also snubbed. But, yeah. Right. I, I mean, I guess uh, are people using the word snubbed because they think that there's, like, racist kind of undertones happening and that it was a specific decision to snub her. I don't think that's it at all. But again, I, we are not privy to the inner workings mm -hmm. of the Academy, perhaps, nor do we want to be. No. Um, <laughs> we like to be like, just kind of like inquisitive and we like to scratch our, our chins and say, hmm, I wonder if. But anyway, uh, I do want to get back to something interesting that is Jewy about Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis, that she, her father, Tony Curtis, was famously also Jewish. And she has really kind of connected, reconnected with her Jewish identity in the recent years. As we had previously reported, and some of you may have seen, she helped finance the rebuilding of the Great Synagogue in Budapest, Hungary. It was the largest synagogue in Europe, and it was originally built in 1859, but suffered damage during World War II. 
She also helped to refurbish the synagogue in town in Hungary, whose name I am about to slaughter, so forgive me, but Matejalka, perhaps, Hmm. um, where her grandparents worshipped. And they created a memorial museum and cafe in memory of her dad, also in Matejalka. And she's been amazing the whole season. Like she's used her pulpit to to do things like calling for afternoon concerts for seniors. You know, she's like calling out people like Bruce Springsteen and saying, you're old, I'm old. Like, let's just call it an afternoon concert so that we (laughs) can go and be home by 8 p.m., right? She's she's spoken about out about hate and anti-Semitism. She's supported her co-stars and all of her sisters in cinema I think that's been amazing. Mm -hmm. People have called her like the cheerleader of this season. I think mainly because I think she was genuinely just happy to be there and did not think she was going to win. So she was like, I'm just going to be happy to be here and praise everybody, which is a great attitude. Right. And I think also having uh, Michelle Yeoh and Jamie Lee Curtis on the same team probably was really helpful for Stephanie Hsu, you know, to have this kind, these kinds of women who are just so experienced in this industry and had never been honored until now. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's an important lesson for her as well. People like to say that the Oscars don't matter. And I don't think that's true because after like those speeches, after seeing Ki Hoi Kwan, like say, mom, I did it. Like that, that to me is like all the reason why the Oscars do matter. Like having Michelle Yeoh, say like ladies never tell like never let anyone tell you you're past your prime which i also think is a jab to don lemon who made a like a remark about age and women on cnn a couple weeks ago like it's just important like seeing people who do a good job win and they're not the same people in like the 95 years of oscar history like that's important I think it will always, the Oscars will always be important. Whether or not everyone's watching, people will watch it because they want to see moments like that where people are grateful. They're just people who have worked really, really hard to get where they are and win that award. I thought it was really moving that so many of the award winners really like embraced their emotions Mm -hmm. and cried. We Mm -hmm. don't see a lot of that, especially from men. But I think that Ki Hoi Kwan, that, you know, his... His joy, his emotion and gratitude was just so inspiring. Even early on in the night, you know, he it had me crying for like five minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's that emotional. Was big. Um, John Travolta, who was introducing the the in memoriam segment, mm-hmm. um, he started off a little like very shaky. Yeah. And I was like, what is wrong with him? Is he all right? Yeah. And then you realize what he's about to do and you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then he he ended up introducing Olivia Newton-John, uh, you know, kind of talking about her without talking about her, but then, you know, saying hopelessly devoted. And I was like, oh, hopelessly devoted. Oh, uh, he misses her. That's so sad. Um, I had no idea from that T-Mobile ad that he missed Olivia Newton-John. You know, I think it's just all of those things happening at the same time were just really, like you said, and it's not just about mattering, but it's about having these collective experiences in the theater and then watching to see if your person, you know, gets the award, like Mm -hmm. feeling invested in the industry and in the stories that are told. The darkened theater where Nicole Kidman has been kept hostage. Oh my God, that was so great. I'm so glad they acknowledged it. Because they were also right next to an AMC theater. I will, Okay, here's my hot take. My hot take is I don't mind that Spielberg and John Williams did not win. There it is. What? That's hot. That's hot. Tell me more. Because they've won before. They know this feeling. Like, yes, I think it would have been nice for him to win because this is his most vulnerable movie. But also, like, he's already won He's won awards for this movie. Like, he's already been celebrated for this movie. And I think he's a good sport about it. Like, I don't think, like, you were going to see him side-eyeing and, like, being pissed off that he didn't win. Also, he was, like, standing, he was giving Kwan a standing ovation. Um, and because they worked together when he was a kid. Like, I think, I think from what I've seen this award season, I think he's more proud of the people who have 
come up and like created art. And I think he's fan growing over that art as much as he's also like reflecting inward at the work he's done. And I don't know. I just like, I think it's okay. I think it's fine that they didn't win because their movies still were great. Um, and like, they already honor John Williams with like all of these amazing accolades and like, he's still doing the music for the last Indiana Jones and there's a documentary about him. Like, I think he's okay. They'll both go to sleep fine. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's, I think that's, that's very nicely put. I will say that I think that I wish that she said had been nominated. Yeah. You know, we talked about that before I watched women talking this weekend and that was, I thought a really beautifully done movie, disturbing, but also in some ways inspiring because it's a group of women who all live in the same community, but come at the problem from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of see all of their perspectives as viable options. And how do you peacefully arrive at a conclusion about something that's so important to the community? And I don't want to like say too much about Mm -hmm. the plot, but I just, that was what I took away from it. And I think that, you know, the idea that Sarah Polly, who used to be, you know, like one of those teen actresses, has become like this incredible director and writer and is doing her own thing. She wore a tuxedo yeah, pantsuit to the Oscars last night. And in some ways, it's a both an acceptance of Hollywood honors, but also a rejection of some of the things that are more antiquated about Hollywood, mm-hmm. including this, you know, insistence on the the enormous dresses and you know if that's not your thing you know wear something else yeah. um and so she's she's being i think herself she's being the champion of women's voices which is so important let's talk about the in memoriam like what was that about what exactly are you reacting to we know <sighs> lenny kravitz was okay playing piano i thought he did a beautiful job i thought lenny kravitz did a beautiful job because some people really try to make their performance about them and not the people you're looking at in the slideshow. And I don't love that. I thought the pacing was good. The music was beautiful. Like I thought that was great. I didn't like that they picked and chose who was going to be featured and then who you could click on after on this stupid little QR code. The fact that they completely missed Topol when there was definitely enough time. Like usually I know people were like, yeah, well he died in 2023. It's like, yeah, but it's usually they'll they'll add them in right before the Oscars. Like if it if it's after the show, they can't do anything about it. But like, I don't want to wait another year to have them honor Topol. He should have been included, especially because he was nominated. He's an Oscar nominated actor. Like he should have been in there. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's I don't know how you make those decisions that this person is worth remembering on stage and this person gets busted into a QR corner. I didn't understand visually what they were doing either. Like there was a there was like at least one time where I was like, oh, is it over? And then they started mm-hmm. it up again and yeah. it was not over. No, it was very weird. There's got to be some sort of PR person or intern or somebody who's in charge of like scouring the papers to make sure that the people who have died most recently are considered for inclusion. So then the question becomes, if they had the name, why did they offload it to, you know, QR Corner? But I don't know. I feel like In Memoriam is one of those things that people have like a strange investment in. Like they want to see their favorites represented. And if they're not there, then they feel like it was like a crap show instead of a slideshow. But it's like a little weird, right? Like, okay, like, okay, sometimes like they have rules. Like if they weren't nominated for anything that they're not going to be featured in the show, which I also think is BS because whatever. Like, a li- like w- and some of them got video features, but not all of them. And like that one is also weird because then you have to pick and choose well who gets one. And I get that like Olivia Newton-John got the John Travolta like tribute in the beginning, but like I would have loved to see her dancing and singing because those were the movies she was like most known for. I want to see her. I don't want to just see a picture of her and then they move on. It was lame. Yeah, I think it would have been interesting to incorporate Louis Newton-John's music into this montage yes. in some way. When Travolta did his intro and mentioned Hopelessly Devoted, and then we we got a shot of Lenny Kravitz at the piano. I'm like, 
is Lenny Kravitz going to interpret <laughs> hopelessly devoted yeah. to you? And is Aaron going to be okay yeah. afterwards? <laughs> and he didn't. Uh, it would have been weird if he had, but it w- would have been interesting. It would have at least made sense. It wouldn't have been like, oh, that's left field. Why are we singing that song? It's like, oh, because she died. And that was a very big song. Right. And it's the only song that got nominated for an Oscar that year of the movie. So it, it would have made sense. But it was just kind of like, yeah, we'll just cobble it together. Who will notice? Everybody knows. Yeah. I just, I wish that there were some way to highlight those folks in a less perfunctory manner, I guess is is my, mm-hmm. is my point. Even the people who were not exiled to a QR corner, as I guess is what I'm officially calling it now. Even those people who were included in the actual presentation, like some of them were so fast, I didn't really know mm-hmm. what they were there for. Even if it said so-and-so cinematographer, I'm like, great, but like, can we see some of that? Yeah. Um, and in some ways, I feel like maybe if you like this idea, call me, Hollywood. Again, get uh, get me on the horn. <laughs> it might be interesting to experiment with before and after commercial breaks, coming back to like a clip of somebody who died that year, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like integrating it a little bit more yeah. or having somebody who knew them talk about them, Ooh. like say a, a word, you know? or having the nominees um, talk about them a little bit. I just think that there's more thoughtful ways to remember yeah, people than a, a, slide a slideshow that seems very unorganized and imbalanced yeah. and stuff like that. I'm with you because honestly, like again, it, it's like performative instead of like doing what, it's like cathartic for everybody to be in the room and clap and hear the reaction of the people who knew them. Like it's nice, especially since like we don't know the people and usually fans, the only way you can really pay tribute to someone is if you go to their star on the Walk of Fame where you see them in an immemorium. And so, yeah, I'm with you. Also, something I noticed is that one of the lead actresses, the model in Triangle of Sadness, she died very, like, I think right before the premiere of the movie. Like, I don't really know the whole story, but she, she died. She's very young and she was not in she was not in yeah. the memoriam. I, maybe she was in the QR code, but her movie was nominated for Best Picture and you're not going to pay tribute to her at all in the main show? That's stupid. Yeah. Did anybody say anything about her when they introduced, but they didn't introduce the movies, right? They didn't introduce... They did Triangle of Sadness because I think it was nominated for Best Picture. Right. But did they have like people talking about the Best Picture nominees? Yes, but... I wasn't listening I even so remember. closely, but I don't remember them saying like, okay, and we're paying tribute to this actress. I don't know. I feel like, okay, if you, if your movie is big, you should be in that, sh- you should be in the show this year, right? Like, I don't know. It yeah. just felt like very, again, very lame, not thoughtful, not well thought out. Like, ugh, you yeah. hate to see it. Yeah, such a Shonda. Although I did like that the museum, because of the Academy Museum, they brought props to the show this year. Nice little advertising for the Academy Museum. Like I like that scene where they were doing the scene when they were doing the two types of editing or like when they would show the type of camera and how it would have to actual, like the practicality of it. I think that's cool. I think that's a cool way to show movie history. Also, that whole thing about the, I know you just said it's one of the things you liked, but, you know, the idea of the, how did they used to shoot when the camera was in in olden times? It just came off very kind of like, you know, that was before cell phones. And I'd be like, well, yeah, a lot of Obviously. Hollywood history happened yeah. before cell phones. Yeah. And it was just, the it wasn't played wasn't for good. a laugh. It was like, oh, you guys might not know. This isn't before <laughs> cell phones. There are people in that room who like, remember. They know. Yeah. Right, right. Again, but the I writing that that wasn't so good. <laughs> also, part of it is that those are younger people playing in an older construct. And I think that um, it might be interesting, just like it was interesting when they did this Oscars in a train station. You remember that? Mm. Like to just kind of really rethink it, like break it into the essential components and see how you can innovate in those spaces and how you can stitch it together into something that is more reflective of, I think, the way we consume content these days. Mm -hmm. But maybe this is a larger conversation. Maybe. I don't know. 
It was cool. You know, when you're talking about um, newspapers, and you can tell me if there's anything similar in the radio world, since that's where you work on a regular basis, is that when you have sponsored content, you have to actually label it sponsored content. And, you know, say that, you know, this is something that we are just slipping it into the awards show Mm -hmm. and make you think that we're introducing an award, but we're really doing a commercial for our movie that's coming out in like a month or something like that is like a, a very strange choice. If they got that opportunity, then why didn't everybody get that opportunity? Maybe don't even have commercial breaks. Just actually do the commercials during the show. But, like the, I we mean, know, but we know why. It's because Disney owns ABC and that's it. And, and it's a reminder to every other company there. Like, yeah, like we didn't win any awards, but like, look at all the power we still have. And I don't think that's what the Oscars should be. Shame on Bob. <laughs> Bad Bob. I hear that. And I think that, you know, obviously we have talked about the Oscars for some time. Yeah. Uh, We could continue to talk about it for some time. You're getting sick Um, of us. But (laughs) yeah, well, I think that here's another interesting perspective on on how how members of the Academy select their their picks for Oscar winners. Entertainment Weekly, which is now unfortunately only an online Mm -hmm. magazine. I miss it so much in my mailbox. Me too. They have an annual feature where they have Hollywood professionals giving their anonymous and uncensored thoughts about how they're picking their selections. And so like you hear from a director, a a writer, a marketing person, an actor, and they just tell you a little bit about these people, but don't actually give the identifying details. Mm -hmm. Um, So you get to see like what their process is. For instance, one of the people they interviewed called the Fablemans a beautiful science fiction film about straight white male privilege. Now, that's something that it's like, that's a pretty harsh critique. Mm -hmm. The fact that a Jewish person might walk into that movie and see something different than somebody who is not Jewish um, somebody who is white might see somebody thing in that story that that is different from somebody who's a person of color uh, or has a different kind of background. And it's just a reminder for me, at least, that everyone has their own lens on Hollywood and what goes on there and what should be rewarded and what stories are need to be told. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, I love looking at those because I think it really is like a safe place for people to just give their raw thoughts. And yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. I understand. I think it's that's what makes movies so amazing. Everybody sees them differently, even though they're all seeing the same thing. But yeah, let us know what you thought of this year's Oscars and we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> Obviously, like I said, we can we can talk about this for a long time. And I think it's worth noting that a moment that happened even before the Oscars on Saturday night at Saturday Night Live, they had a cold open this week that was like a send up of awards show commentary. Mm-hmm. And so one of the guests was Sarah Sherman playing Michelle Williams's Judaism coach. Mm-hmm. And so she was laid on the Brooklyn, New York accent, blah, 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 you know, was that kind of like impression. Um, And they also mentioned that, I said it now, I said also, they they also (laughs) mentioned that she was the marvelous Mrs. Maisel's coach, which I think is an interesting thing that they brought up, you know, because people understand that this is an issue Mm -hmm. and, you know, can't rely on Saturday Night Live always to do the heavy lifting on social change. So I will say that, you know, take the follow what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. Sarah Sherman's character said that Michelle Williams did a good job for a Goyim Mm. and a Goyim is not a thing. Goyim is plural. Plural. It's actually a little bit derogatory, I I think, anyway, to, to call somebody a goy or to call people goyim because it's never really used like complimentarily. No. So that was like a little bit of a groan for me. But she also used a good Baruch Hashem in there, which yeah. I think is so funny. And she did use it right. So <laughs> she right did context. use it right and she pronounced it right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I told you that I saw this, this uh, show, Modern Orthodox, years ago where Jason Biggs, who's not Jewish, was playing a religious guy and he kept saying things like, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. And he pronounced it fine, but he also used it to mean chas v'shalom, like God forbid. Mm -hmm. So like he would use them interchangeably and it was really distracting. Um, Yeah. But like I'm always down for a good, well-pronounced, contextually appropriate Baruch Hashem. Yeah, it's really hard because I like Sarah Sherman and I think she's very funny and like she's one of those unapologetic 
unapod- unapologetically Jewish. I don't even think I said it right then. She just is really funny and really out there and really loud and fun. And she portrays a Jewishness that is so overplayed and very stereotypical where I'm like, oh, like more, like, no, I don't want more of it. Like, and I hate that because I still laugh and I'm still proud of it, you know, because I think she she is funny sometimes and she does like share a glimmer of truth when she's doing that. And that's also her experience. So I don't want to like shut down her life and her stories and her experience, but it just feels like more of the same. Oh, maybe I'm the problem. I don't know, because I laugh, but it's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that we have to temper our expectations when it comes to Saturday Night Live and Jewish representation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there is a long tradition of Jewish for the comedy, you know, kind of Jewish for the jokes there. And there are a couple of places that it was done really well uh, over the years. And I think my father is actually doing research on this right now uh, about how Jewish representation tracks across SNL. So I may have future things to share on that. You know, I'm, like I said, always around for a good Baruch Hashem, but I really want people to to do some some sort of research, some humility that you might not know everything. Like even when people ask me to like translate something into Hebrew, I usually give them four or five different versions because it's like, well, is it this per, you know, is it, is it a singular person? Is it plural people? Is it men? Is it women? Is it a mixed group? You know, are they outside? Are they inside? Like I Mm -hmm. I always ask all these questions and be like, well, if you want to say, give me, and it's a demand, then you say this. If you want to, if you want to suggest that, you know, somebody give you something, it's a softer word. So I think that, you know, those kinds of things stick in my craw, as they like to say. I don't know. I don't think you're a problem for laughing at it, Erin. I'm here to validate you. No, but you know what I mean? Like, we criticize it, but we laugh anyway. So it's like this never-ending circle of, well, there it is. Well, I think we can contain our opposites. We can both enjoy something and think it's not well done. Um, I <laughs> think that those those things are, are not mutually <laughs> exclusive. Love that for us. But yeah, as we move out of our Oscar spiel and into our speed round, we've got a couple things to end the week with you. Yes. There is an episode of The Equalizer that aired this week in which Harry Kashagian, who's played by Adam Goldberg, who we know as the Hebrew Hammer, reveals that he has Jewish heritage. And as you might have guessed from the last name, Kashagian, the character has long been established as being of Armenian and American heritage. But for this episode, one of the co-showrunners, Adam Glass, decided to add this backstory of having a Jewish mother and a complicated relationship with that side of his faith. This was profiled very nicely in an article in the JTA, which we will include in the show notes. But it's always interesting when a show uses Jewish identity to deepen a character's reaction. So I'm looking forward to seeing this episode. I will say that also on a previous episode of The Equalizer, they solved a case because someone identified the fact that there was an A-roof wire in a photograph. Mm. And so based on that, uh, they were able to figure out like where in the city that person was. Oh, wow. So I think it's really interesting when you take something and it's not just like an, oy vey, here we go again, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, or even a Baruch Hashem, you know, it's like, the having the something very specific in the case of this particular episode of the equalizer the character is is tackling anti-semitic hate crimes in brooklyn so anti-semitism is often a crucible for revealing jewish identity mm-hmm. you know people be like oh they're oh, this is anti-semitism so what no big deal i'd be like well i'm jewish you know and then somebody is like and they're, oh, I don't know. You don't look Jewish. You know, people like do the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So whenever there's any current character that does something a little bit more thoughtful, not just allows the character to exist within the show, but gives them a deeper motivation, a larger context, a set of beliefs, all of that, I'm I'm here for it. We love to see it. And Schmigadoon is returning for season two. They dropped a Schmicago trailer uh, last week, and it's going to be like a darker season than uh, the Brigadoon first 
season, but it looks like everybody's returning and then they're adding some fun people. And I imagine that this season they're going to have more Bob Fosse, Gwen Verdon pieces like Chicago, Sweet Charity, Cabaret, like all the darker kind of burlesque Roaring Twenties set shows. Ratata. Yes. Ratata. <laughs> and I can't Ratata. wait. It's not Jewish per se. It just is something I'm really enjoying. And I know you enjoyed it. And I, I was surprised to like it so much throughout. And so, and my dad, he was like, hey, did you know about this show? I was like, yeah, I, it, it definitely wasn't something I was going to recommend for you, but he really liked it. So, you know, you never know. It's pretty delightful. Yeah. They do a really great job with the music and choreography, which is what you want from a series like this. They've got people you love to watch, uh, you know, Cecily Strong and yeah. Keegan-Michael Key and Dove Cameron and Aaron Alan Tavay, Cumming. Yeah. Christian Chenoweth. Yes. All of these like very well-known theater actors. They're all awesome. And they can really do a lot of different styles, which I'm appreciative of. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing like, you know, this more Fosse Verdon kind of stuff that you're talking about. Mm. It should be really interesting. Um, it also has like a very crazy ex-girlfriend kind of sensibility to it. Yeah. And I just, as, as you can probably hear, I've been kind of sick for the last week. And when I can't sleep at night, I just put on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Thank you, Netflix, for hosting it for me. And I rewatched the the fourth season, which I think in the first episode has this uh, this jail scene that's supposed to be like a send-up oh, yeah. of the Chicago scene. Mm -hmm. So where she just starts telling me, like, story, story, right. what's your story? And she goes, -da -da. It's very... I mean, so I just feel like that sensibility was very much reflected in the trailer. Totally. And it makes me, but every time I see something like that, and I'm like, it reminds me of your crazy ex-girlfriend. I'm like, why is Rachel Bloom not in it? Like, why is hey, she not writing songs you for never it? Know. I don't understand. Maybe, but. maybe she'll join soon. Who knows? But it's going to be on Apple TV Plus April 7th. It is a very like Apple TV Plus week for us, which is very odd because usually it's not. Yes. And I just want to say also about Schmigadoon, like we said, it's really not Jewish per se, but, you know, obviously musical theater is kind of Jewish. And I found out that Julie Klausner, who was um, half of the duo that created Difficult People, is one of the writers for this season. So I have every reason to believe that there'll be some Jewy content kind of uh, Peppered hidden in. in there somewhere. And what was I going to say about her? Uh, so she and I were in Purim Spiel together many years ago. That was really fun. And she obviously did, did a lot of very Jewy things in Difficult People. You know, there's a whole episode about Reboot that they called Refuts. <laughs> you know, it talked about like how she was trying to use Jewish identity to um, advance her career. So that was, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing her mark on that. Another thing that, that you might have seen that she created or helped create is um, Christmas Time for the Jews, which is that um, claymation that. thing that they did on SNL. Iconic. That was about, you know, a very, very iconic Jewish uh, Christmas song. Also very good. It's a great parody song. I think one of the things that works so well with this show is that they really know how to match the tone of the musical they're mimicking in a way that feels familiar. So that way, when they are putting their own spin on it, you're like, oh yeah, I can buy this. This feels right. And I, I, and that's why Crazy Ex-Girlfriend works because they know how to genre hop and really match the tone. Um, so that's on Apple TV plus April 7th. And the moment you didn't know you were waiting for the world's happiest show is back. The, the show about soccer that, that somehow gets everybody excited, Ted Lasso, is back for its third, possibly final season this week. Also on Apple TV+. Plus. <laughs> There's other things that Ted Lasso is, of course, also about. Um, why not be ultra cheerful and then, you know, kind of nest in a mental health awareness storyline? Mm -hmm. um, it's also about shortbread in little pink boxes. Yes. And it's also about friendship and learning how to be a leader and Brett Goldstein just being the best he can be. Yeah, it's a delight and it's really, really successful for a reason. And it's back this week. Yeah. I'll say also about Brett Goldstein is that 
Uh, first of all, how marvelous that his name is Brett Goldstein. <laughs> and secondly, he is going to be Hercules in the upcoming, you know, Marvel yes. Universe. Um, which is hilarious, I think. Without Ted Lasso, you wouldn't have that. You also wouldn't have Shrinking, which is currently yes. one of my favorite shows, also on Apple TV+. Plus. It's so good. I know. Well, I think that I want to do an episode in the future about like psychologists in general, okay. like on TV, because there have been so, so many of them. I'm sold. Good. I'm glad I, I gave you the hard sell. <laughs> but Without Ted Lasso, you don't have the elevation of Brett Goldstein, and you don't have that Hercules. You don't have Shrinking, uh, which he co-wrote. And I think we're very glad that Ted Lasso is back, but we are very glad that Ted Lasso brought us many gems and gifts, including Brett Goldstein. Mm-hmm. This has been The Bagel Report, a production of Jay, the Jewish News of Northern California, and a part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network. Thank you to Lev Gringaz, our producer from Jew Folk, Inc., David A.M. Walensky and Andrew Essenston, and Danny Lipsky for creating our logo. You can find us wherever podcasts are listened to. Connect with us on social, on Twitter, at Esther K, at Eben Mosh, and at The Bagel Report, on Instagram at Esther Kostanowitz, at Eben Mosh, and TBR The Pod, and by emailing us at thebagelreport at gmail.com. Now go and watch something interesting and maybe we'll talk about it next time on The Bagel Report.